Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Luna. I'm the program manager for Echo's Design Leadership Program. I would like to start by presenting our new video about the second season. So it's a two or three minute video, super, super easy and engaging. Let me start by presenting that. Give me just one second. Design is leadership. In recent years, we've begun to see that the most successful organizations are the ones that infuse their business with design at the core. In our 12-week program, you will hear from and interact with some of the world's most highly regarded design and innovation leaders from across the globe. Our exclusive masterclass sessions will give you insights into how design leaders think and act in order to elevate design in their own organizations to deliver exceptional outcomes. participate in more hands-on workshops with design leaders from your region in which you will deep dive into some of the theory and practical activities behind the masterclass topics. The Design Leadership Program is for those who want to learn how to manage and grow their team, develop their design vision, act as an advocate and catalyst for design within their organization and generally navigate the challenging yet rewarding world of design leadership. We know that the realm of design is constantly evolving. Our biggest goal is to help you develop the skills needed to become a great design leader who can continue to navigate the ever-changing world of business and society over the next decade. We hope to see you in season two of the Design Leadership Program. I hope you guys enjoy it. I've been asking for feedback. And now I would like to present the slides that will be guiding us. I'm here today with this amazing group of people. I'm so glad that, Carol, this is your last far session of the season, right? Yes. Yeah, and you have such an amazing group. I'm, I'm so <laughs> happy to have you here, Chavi again. Omar, we had the opportunity to speak before. Lawrence, I don't get to know you yet, but um, I think after today, I'll have an idea and I'll pick on your brain as well. So I'm quite excited. As Carol said earlier, please let us know where you guys are joining us from. I'm quite excited to know. I know that at least I am in San Diego, United States. Carol is in Berlin. Chavi and Omar, Omar are in uh, Bologna. Lawrence, I don't know where you're at. So I know that we are at least in five different countries or cities. So please let us know what kind of design you do and where you're joining us from. Uh, so I'm, uh, I know some of you don't know us yet. We are an independent lab uh, driven by design. We have three business models. The one that is uh, hosting us today is School of Design Thinking. We help business to create value and innovations for good. And we help people and organizations master the innovation mindset, mindset skills and tools. Over the past um, 11 years, We've graduated a, around 40,000 and 70,000 people. We are a global team. As I said, I'm in the US. We have people in Italy, Portugal, Brazil, Australia, and hoping to expand even more. My slides are 
changing very slowly. I don't know if the same happens with you guys, but for my, in my end, everything is going super, super slow. We are part of the Global Design Thinking Alliance. We are the only innovation lab, independent lab, among all the universities doing uh, conducting research and design. It's such an honor to participate among this big, big names. And what about the ECHO's Design Leadership Program season two that it's starting in less than 15 days. I cannot even imagine such thing because we've been on the journey since the, I would say November, October, actually no, September last year. So it has been in a while since we started preparing. And it's starting 15 days. This is a 12 week program. Uh, Carol, can Carol and Xavi can definitely talk more about it because we all took the course as uh, students as well last season. This is a journey map and you'll be able to find it on our website and the syllabus. But the way that we broke it down or how we broke it down from this four spheres, which for us represent uh, the basic pillars of design leadership or where it should come from, which is a lot about you and yourself. You need to understand who you are in order for you to then unfold that into the way that you lead uh, your team. It's a lot about you and your team. So a lot about you listening, talking, giving feedback, being empathetic. And that the relationship between you and you, you and others will definitely impact in the outcomes of what you are creating with your team. So it's a lot about products and services and how to master that, how to create valuable products, how to understand technology, how to understand the future. And no matter what it is that we're doing, we always impact someone's life or an environment around us. So it is a lot about us or you as a leader and the systems where you are located or impacting. This is some of the masterclass speakers for season two. We have more people coming up, still a couple of things that we can say yet, a little bit of surprise um, that we can share yet. We are bringing big, big names. The idea is that every season we change most of the lineup just so we can have a broader perspective of what design leadership is and how different countries and different organizations are conducting their parameters, how they are defining the parameters for our design leadership is. We start on May 9th, all the way until August 3rd. We have a little break between um, the week seven or eight. I'm not precise right now, I don't remember. But it's just so we can honor a little bit of summer vacation. Those in Italy understand how important that is, but I'm pretty sure everywhere in Europe and somehow in the US and Australia, we need to honor a little bit of the summer vacation. Uh, if you have any questions about the structure of the course, please reach out to me. Later on uh, during the slides, before we finish, I'll, I'll share with you my email. But now let's just listen to what you guys have to say. I'm quite honored to be here just to listen tonight. Uh, and Carol, the state is all yours. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, Luna. And thank you again uh, for you and for- I don't think I can for... hear, well, wait, it's my problem. You're good, okay. you're good. <laughs> All right, thank you again uh, for the invite, not only from you, but also from ECHOS. Like you said, I took the, the first cohort last year of the design leadership program, and I'm very happy to be joining and hosting the last out of three sessions, right? We've been in a row of three weeks with different sessions on design leadership uh, during April. And I'm very happy to host this session together with Lawrence, Omar and Xavi uh, today on what it, is, what it is actually like to become a design leader, right? But before I give the mic to everyone, let me quickly introduce myself. So I am Carolina. I'm the head of product design at CoachUp. I'm Brazilian and I'm based in Berlin. I have always been a designer. I am completely passionate about design and I've worked in different areas of design from branding to graphic to environmental design to now more recently product design. And of course, uh, now being a manager and being a leader uh, of a team of 25 designers. So uh, to kickstart this session, I would like to first invite um, our guests to maybe introduce themselves a little bit and also uh, while you do that, maybe uh, give us a little insight on where and how do you connect with design leadership. So maybe if we could start with Omar. Thank you very much, Carolina. Thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, also, thanks to Luna. It's great to be here. Um, my story. Okay. So um, uh, I studied communication design uh, in the late 80s. I was lucky enough to go work with one of my teachers, which 
in that case was uh, also became one of became my first boss. And this is an issue I'd like to speak about afterwards on how important it is to select the right people to, to study with and to, and to work with. Um, this teacher boss of mine, Dolcini, a very famous and well-known um, public service communication designer uh, uh, that unfortunately uh, passed away early, but he introduced me uh, immediately to what was uh, a socially, let's say, engaged uh, design. From there, I was lucky enough to go, after 10 years, to go work with Oliviero Toscani in uh, United Colors of Benetton, but not, not working with the brand, but working for their research center uh, called Fabrica. Maybe some of you uh, know, know the place. And that's where I was uh, head of visual communication for 16 years. And that's where my passion for socially impacting design became international and, uh, and working with uh, United Nations, Teachers Without Borders, other uh, global important social issues. Um, after that, uh, ECOGRADA, the International uh, Council of Communication Design. Today is ICOD, International Council of Design. I was also, uh, more recently, I was president of the design committee for the stamps and coins uh, department of the Republic of San Marino. Um, I was also recently um, working at the London College of Communication in the University of Arts London as course leader for the mass service and innovation. And coming to some more recent history, Today, I'm consulting, uh, teaching, training uh, in the areas of innovation, service design, brand communication for both public and, uh, and, and private uh, entities. Um, I think that responds to the first question, Carolina. What was the second one for me? Uh, <laughs> how to make it short, very short. Yeah. <laughs> where and how did you get in contact with design leadership? Well, I have, yeah, certainly it was. Well, first of all, with the, the first design leaders I, I worked with, uh, as I was mentioning, uh, of course, it's, it's, the, it's the people, not the roles, not the, not the places. Um, but as a design leader myself, that was probably when I shifted from a design position to a leadership position as head of the visual communication department at Fabrica, the, the Benetton Communications Research Center in in Italy. That's how, yeah, right. I, I would say that's that's how I got I, I got my, my feet wet in the design. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Then yeah, very soon we'll talk more about that. Maybe cool. now uh, I can give the mic to Chiavi to introduce herself as well. Of course. <laughs> Hi Carolina. Hi everyone. It's uh, amazing always to share the stage with such experienced people. Thank you for sharing your story. Um, okay, I can tell a little bit Thank about you. myself. <laughs> I'm Chubby. I'm an Indian origin designer who moved to Italy about six years ago. I'm the head of design at Future Food Institute. It's an ecosystem working on sustainability issues in the food system. So a lot of my work is using design approaches uh, with institutions like FAO for uh, food and agricultural organization to drive sustainability systemically through education. But also at the same time, which is where the triple helix model comes into place, working with food companies like Nestle and Barilla and helping them develop new products that are healthy, that are more sustainable, that, have, that come from sustainable supply chains. So really tackling the complex issues in the food system. That's what I do today. And uh, how I, I came about to get to know design leadership, uh, I feel that, uh, since so I have very little experience working in design studios because I was always someone who wanted to bring design in non-design contexts. So I, I was working with, you know, Center for Disabled Children, or I was working with um, CELCO, which is another um, social impact organization in India. And then I started working in food systems space. So working with NGOs, working with, you know, R&Ds, so I wanted to bring design in non-design context. And that's when I realized that it wasn't enough as being the lone designer. 
that there was a need to create a movement, there was a need to create, um, spread awareness about the what design can actually bring in terms of impact, in terms of sustainability, in terms of social innovation. So that's where I found myself really taking this, this role of almost like the ambassador of the design practice into uh, social impact fields or into entrepreneurship and business fields. And that's when I started making my own team and started taking this role of even training young designers and, uh, and empowering them and making them realize the power that they have as creatives uh, in the world. Wow, a true leader then, right? Really opening the doors and creating the uh, uh, the design environment in companies. Really nice, Yavi. Thank you for sharing. Lawrence, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, uh, thank you. Um, and uh, thank you very much for the um, invitation. Great to be part of this. Um, so, uh, can I, well, firstly, I'm, I'm very honored to be considered a, a design leader. Um, like Omar, um, we were probably studying around the same time. I'm, um, and it's very polite to be to be um, referred to this as experience rather than old age. So I guess it's um, a combination of both. But uh, I started my my career after graduating the Royal College of Art in the late eighties um, in London, and. Uh, let me be totally honest, I never had any kind of master plan or game plan, um, more just, you know, in the late 80s, you were coming out into a recession in London, and it was just survival rather than any kind of plan to be some kind of design leader. Um, I worked as a designer, graphic designer, as an illustrator, and um, I think on reflection, if I, if I look back at my career and wonder how I came to do the things that I've done. And I've, I've set up studios, I've set up um, businesses, I've, I've written a whole bunch of books on, on contemporary design illustration, like Omar, very involved uh, for, a, for a while with Ico Brada, with the Design Council here in London, with um, BIMA, the British Interactive Media Association. Um, and it was never a master plan to, to become a design leader. It was, it was more that I'm one of those people that I think I've realized is kind of opinionated and has something to say. So I kind of felt that because I had something to say, maybe there might be one or two people um, prepared to listen. Where am I now? Well, um, alongside a career as uh, as um, as a practitioner, I like Omar um, have worked in design education, and somehow three decades later, I'm still involved in design education. I now run a, a very large faculty um, of 5,000 students, 300 staff, and um, it's across all subject areas of art, design, and media. I wake up some mornings wondering how on earth they've trusted me with this responsibility, and I leave some evenings high-fiving and thinking, wow, what an amazing job I have. Um, and if there is something around design leadership, it's not just those 5,000 students that I hope I'm kind of a small part of inspiring, but also, you know, as I get older and I guess somehow towards the end of my career, uh, I think design leadership is, is about nurturing younger design-savvy staff into becoming the, the future and design leaders, if that makes sense. I'll, I'll, I'll stop now. That's probably enough of a ramble from me. Oh, that was actually the perfect, uh, and I forgot the English word, but the perfect uh, end, because the next question that I had was exactly why it is for you design leadership? So maybe, Lawrence, if you can go on a little bit more on, since you were already going to that direction, and then I can ask the others as well. Sure, sure. <laughs> thanks. Um, I think, um, and, and like Omar, you know, I felt very fortunate when I came out of the Royal College of Art, I worked for a, I worked for a great designer, a, a guy called Tim Lamb, who ran a, a successful but small agency in London called Lamb and & Shirley. And I learned a lot from, you know, I guess I was in my early 20s, I was watching someone at the height of their career um, run pretty large projects for big brands. And I was a kind of small part of that as a very junior designer at that point. But um, I don't think Tim would, would mind me telling you this story. But one thing I learned was that his, 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 his kind of approach to design leadership 
was to arrive into the studio at about four o'clock in the afternoon with crates of beer and pizza and somehow encourage the younger designers to stay through till midnight. We'd all, we'd all been there since 10 in the morning. Tim would have been sleeping off yesterday's hangover and he would arrive with crates of beer and a kind of party at. And this was the kind of culture in design studios in London at that point, you know, because we were young. And what I learned from that experience was it's great fun for a couple of years when you're very young, but that's not a way to kind of inspire people. And I guess my approach to being a design leader, I hope is to, um, to inspire people through the way in which I work and that hopefully people will have come out of the courses I've run or the staff that have worked alongside me and seen that there's a kind of can-do attitude, roll sleeves up attitude. Um, and the thing about design leader, it, it kind of implies that somebody's at the front leading. And I think a good design leader is someone that brings a team together and that team are all part and parcel of, of, of getting that project, whatever it is across the line. And so a design leader may have more experience, maybe the person that brings the project in, but they're not any more important than anybody else in that team. And I guess that's how I've kind of run design departments, agencies, and now in the world of education, kind of large faculties. Um, you know, having said that, the buck does kind of stop with me if things go horribly wrong. So I understand the responsibility I have. But they tend not to, which is a good thing. Awesome, awesome. Thank you for sharing. Maybe, Kathy, would you like to also share what you believe is the role of a design leader? Yeah, there are so many different answers to that, actually. Maybe I'll focus on a couple of them. So one of those were what I mentioned in my previous answer about empowering other designers, helping them find their voice and the leader within. I really believe in the entrepreneurial approach of allowing people for, to be bottom-up leaders, uh, giving them opportunities to co-lead with you as opposed to having a more like a very top-down approach. The second one I think is a lot about self-improvement, constantly upgrading your craft to make sure that you're relevant to the world today. And, and I feel that's something that I've followed in my path. Like I started from product and interaction designer, I went to food design, to food entrepreneurship, to food systems, and now focusing on systemic innovation. And I felt like I kept carving a, a new field and a world for myself based on uh, how things were changing. And third, uh, I feel the responsibility uh, when it comes to design leaders as to designing for sustainability, designing in a planet-centric way. So I'm, I'm working on a new methodology that uh, supports planet-centric design and I'm publishing around that. So I, I really feel as a design leader, it's also that responsibility that you bring out your vision into the world that today we need to be designing for sustainable development goals and uh, enabling the people around you to do that. Amazing, amazing. I can also so much identify with what you said, not, not only now, but also before about bringing design and leading design in places where there is no, right? Uh, that is definitely being leadership and, and growing the maturity of design within the world and the corporate environments and other environments as well. So really, really nice. Thank you. Thank you, Xavi. Omar, would you like to share a little bit your thoughts as well? Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Um, I was thinking, you know, what does it take? What does it mean to be a design leader? Uh, because before you're that, you're something else, of course. So uh, it's, a, it's a question of a series of really important shifts in mindset, in activities, and in uh, knowledge, and so on. Uh, but first of all, I think in the majority of cases, probably less today, because as Chavi was saying, you know, um, not necessarily design leaders come from design today, always less. Uh, in the old days, as Lawrence and I know, it was, it was starting with design. There's a huge shift from craft to management. You have to give up craft, but you don't, have, you don't have to forget it. You have to keep working on it, of course, guiding other people's around it, but you're not the craft person anymore and you become the manager. You're not making, you're guiding, uh, you know, you're shedding light, you're giving vision and so on. You're, you're managing people, mostly people, managing people in private. So there's a shift from ego 
to empathy for others. There's a shift from me to we, as we were, you know, Lawrence was saying before also. Um, and there's a great shift from design creativity to strategic creativity. So, the, the, you know, the, the big word, the word, you know, the magic word is probably strategy. You, you, you have to move from that, uh, you know, that craft to, to strategy. And strategy means acquiring a whole new bunch of skills. Um, skills of a, of a totally different nature. I'm, I'm so bad with anything that's financial or economic skills. <laughs> I still have to learn those actually. Um, mostly you have to understand what strategy is about. And as a young designer, that's not easy. You're mostly into craft and making beautiful form and, and trying to communicate you know, important messages. But you have to understand. You have to, you know, understand that your job becomes in deciding what's good and what's bad. It's deciding what's important, what's not important, and it's about deciding where the group needs to go, how to get there, and why do they want to get there? You know, the, famous, the famous why. I think these are uh, big shifts in in moving from you know uh, from design to to design leadership. Um, and then you have a series of other major challenges that are, there's a physical sacrifice, right, Lawrence? <laughs> there's a huge physical sacrifice. It's about, it's about sleeping less, traveling a lot, uh, less play, less family time. It's about eating often as it just comes. And this part is big. And after, you know, after, after some years, you start taking it in. You have to, you have to uh, deal, deal with that. Um, these are, um, I think what, it, yeah, these are important changes. Then, you know, what is it, you know, what is important to become now? So these, this is what happens when you become a design leader. Some of the things that happen, of course, just some, uh, a lot of good things and a lot of, you know, bad, you know, a lot of good activities, new activities are less, some that are less interesting and so on. Some that are, you know, more difficult and challenging because you you deal with with people at, at every turn and their needs and their you know and your needs and so on so you know it's a lot about uh diplomacy also and so on but what is it if i were to give some a young person uh, a suggestion on how to become a design leader i would say um don't choose the school but choose the teachers Make sure who you're going to be learning from and not what school is going to be giving you your, your piece of paper, your title. Uh, and then after that, don't choose a company. You, know, you do have to go work for a company. Uh, I think it's really important to, to have that experience, a company experience, because that'll put you right in the middle of people. Okay. Uh, but don't choose a company. Uh, choose the people in the company. So, I mean, it may be really cool to go work for you know, Fjord or, uh, or IDEO, uh, ex extremely cool, certainly in any case, but make sure to be with the people that are really right for you and not just anyone from those companies. Uh, I think that these first encounters with people will, that will be your first leaders will make an extraordinary difference for the rest of your life. I think that that makes and so much me, sense. And let me Please just go. add one more thing. One, one, last, one last thing, which is, <laughs> are you interested in becoming a design leader? If you think you are, then try it as soon as you can. As soon as someone gives you the, the opportunity to become a design leader, take it. Don't be afraid. I was afraid. I, 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 I a, a series of uh, opportunities, and I'm sorry about that. Uh, but so I'm saying, if you have an get an opportunity, take it, even though you might think it's not the right one, but take it because you'll understand if you're cut to be a design leader, which is not not for everyone. I've I've know I've uh, you know I know I've seen a lot of careers move to design leadership and then move back to craft because these people understood that yeah that's what they really really wanted that's what really made them happy. Um, so yeah, one, my last suggestion is try it as soon as you can, you know, take it from a, with a design thinking, you know, attitude, prototype it, test it, see if it really works for you. 
That is very true, right? Uh, and I will definitely, uh, we will definitely talk a little bit more about what to do if you want to become a design leader, right? But I also wanted to uh, push back before we go into the, the next question on one small thing that, that you mentioned, Omar, especially now, at least in the, the world where I work, where is this, which is startups, uh, there is a trend of having a career path through leadership that involves management and a career path that, in, that is also a leadership, but it's what we call a technical leadership, right? You're not managing people, but you're still a leader. And I wanted to hear a little bit from, from, from you as well. What do you, what do you think about that? And also what are the main differences um, about being a leader as in a design leader, a technical leader and a people leader as well? Maybe if you want to go more. Uh, well, yeah, I, I have to say that uh, Lawrence, I think, already gave the answer I would give you now, which is um, you have to, yeah, you have to become a servant of the people. You have to become a servant of the way someone needs to end, come in. Let me see. You'll be, just a second. I have a, I have a, my, my partner is passing through my studio because she left the keys out. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> okay. So, and yeah, you have to uh, you have to give up a lot of ego, and you have to you know make the good of the people around you your major objective of every day. And if you're good at that, they will be great, and your whole team and your whole company will do will do really good work. And I don't think that's technical. I think that's certainly. Uh, 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 so it's, it's, a, it's a human, it's certainly a human and uh, personal trait uh, you have or, or you don't have. And, um, and that along, and along with that, you have to, you have to have vision and people want to have to want to be with you and follow you, not just because you're good at giving them what they need to do a good job, but because they believe in uh, what you believe in, they believe in they want to follow you where you want to go because they understand that that's going to be great for everyone in the pack. <laughs> so I think this is certainly what is important in that. So, and that also that also means like for people to stay after hours uh, with beer and pizza, uh, which is again not not something that all leaders can do because or want to do because they want to go home with their family and so on or or go you know go to the movies and stuff. You know, so that's yeah, that's uh, that's that's really important. Uh, on the technical side, technical side, you have to have the right attitude. You have to have the right soft skills because the the hard skills you can learn very easily. The soft skills, yeah, you can acquire them with time, but a lot of soft skills are uh, are not that easy to to, to pick up. So uh, yeah, I'm. To be a good technical leader, you have to have you have to have these. So yeah, yeah, more than yeah, you have to have more hard skills. But of course, having a good amount of soft skills is is also is also really good. All right. Before I ask you what skills would you would you would you quote here, I also would like to 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 hear Chavi's opinion, as you also mentioned a little bit in the in the chat uh, about technical leadership. I'm actually in the process of discovering that about myself. So I was most curious to hear what the more experienced people in this uh, panel had to say about that. But it's uh, it's something that I am kind of, they are the two, that is the tension within me as a leader right now. Uh, I love the work and I, and I feel that I have evolved. I'm evolving with my soft skills. Uh, so it isn't a question of which kind of leadership um, leader I am, I think I'm feeling more like which kind of a leader I want to be. So I feel I could sit in both spheres and, and, and I'm, uh, I'm not, I won't be surprised if more designers feel this way because one of the main skills of design is empathy, right? And empathy is at the heart of the soft skills uh, in any sphere of life. So I feel that designers are, let's say, more um, suited to develop the soft skills for leadership, but it also has to be a choice for them. Like, do you enjoy people management more or do you enjoy really working on your craft and producing 
um, the great outputs from your craft. So I'm, yeah, that's my two cents on that. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, thank you. Lawrence, would you like to say a few words as well? Yeah, I, I, at the risk of sounding controversial, I, I, I don't think that one leaves one's craft when one becomes a leader. I think what, what one does is expand on the opportunity for one's craft. And actually, you know, when you're, when you're a practitioner, a designer as part of a team, um, you know, you're a, you're a critical part, you're a critical component of that team. But as you become the kind of design leader and the person responsible for that team, you have that opportunity to, for, for your, your craft to shift and change. Your craft may well be about leadership, but the craft, you don't lose sight of what's important about the craft, is my view. You know, you still want to make great work. And part of making great work is getting great people together. And there's a lot to be said for the skill it takes to put a great team of people together. And that can't just be on technical expertise. It has to be on how are that group going to work together? How are they going to function? How are they going to kind of live and breathe and participate in, in, in the projects? And, you know, what are, what are, what are the components that make a, a team of people work together? You know, I think Omar talked about kind of purpose and common goal. Um, and so much of making that team function i say making you know you provide the environment you create the the environment that that people want to work and they want to thrive and they want to be part of something and that comes through communication it comes through clarity in that communication but absolutely it comes through craft i've seen a lot of agencies that start with the purpose of making great work and as that team expands and the pressure on the leadership team to be pulling in projects that pay a certain amount because they've got salary bills to pay, they've got departments to pay for, when they take their eye off the craft and what the purpose was, what they set up in order to do in the first instance, quite quickly you can see that diminish very rapidly and they're chasing the money rather than the, the 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 creativity and i think the great agencies the great studios are the ones that absolutely balance the 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 need to make the thing work financially but most importantly are doing the kind of work that inspires great designers to want to join them and be part of that 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 journey and that for me is the kind of big the big piece behind design leadership you know what is it going to take to pull together a really fantastic team and pull together clients that want to work with that team and the longevity of making that work is you know that you can probably count on 10 fingers the number of agencies that are, are still going still making great work 20 20 25 years after they formed because most of them, somewhere along the line, the thing kind of falls apart because they start chasing the wrong thing and they take their eye off of why the craft and why communication is, uh, you know, is, is important. I don't know if that answers the question. It's a bit of a ramble, but uh, there might be something in there. Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Lawrence. Um... Also going a little bit on Luna's question here, right? Can I ever become a design leader if I don't have a specific technical design background? I also would love to, to, to answer that, but I will of course open the mic uh, to the others, but that's exactly one of the reasons why I actually became a design leader because I've worked in many companies, especially in-house where there was no design leader. I was always, um, reporting to someone from product, someone from marketing, someone from different areas. And in the end, I was always advocating for design, right? I needed to bring that on. So for me, of course, I, I, I truly believe you can be a design leader if you, if you were not a designer, but I truly believe 
we need more designers to become leaders because they truly understand they've lived design, right? And they can make a huge difference. I would love to also hear um, your thoughts on that. Maybe Lawrence, if you want to go. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't disagree with any of that. And, and, and actually the kind of soft skills and the transferable skills that we have as designers um, are, are too often, too frequently overlooked by um, companies that don't, have designers in the boardroom. Um, one of the, the, the challenges I have at the moment in the role that I'm in is that I now work for, a, for uh, having worked for specialist universities and, and Omar talked about London College of Communication, part of University of the Arts London. You know, I would go into a room and everybody in that room would be from the world of art design media. They would be from across the cultural and creative um, industries. And whilst we might disagree, we could all kind of understand uh, a range of different perspectives, whether it's an artist in the room, whether it was a designer, you know, it, we kind of made it work. I now work for a university where I represent, as I said, a faculty of 5,000 students, but the other faculties are life sciences and health, uh, uh, business, there, there are a whole range of subject areas that, that traditionally sit outside of, of design. We're trying to make those connections with other industries, with other subject areas, because that's important that, that, that the agenda that creativity brings is kind of, uh, is welcomed. But I'm finding myself frequently having kind of boardroom dis discussions with people that have never been within the cultural and creative sectors of uh, have not worked with with designers and that's a challenge for them and it's a challenge for me to make sure that I'm representing our needs but also that they can see that a creative mindset into some of the problems that that we have to solve as a team and I'm one member of that kind of executive team inside the university that there are other ways of resolving things and other ways of doing things and and um it's unfortunate that uh, for whatever reason, not enough boardrooms have designers around the table engaged and involved in making those kind of high level executive decisions. So in answer to, do you need a technical background? No, I don't, I don't think you necessarily do need a technical background, but you absolutely have to understand the subject kind of, you know, 360 degrees inside out and, um, you know that in order to represent it is my view yes i fully agree right uh, maybe also moving on uh, a little bit to other questions as well um omar you mentioned a little bit of that before but i would love to listen as uh, from you and also from you chavi because you're a, a more recent leader like i am uh what what are the challenges that you faced when you transitioned to a leadership position? What are the, the challenges that you see other leaders also facing when they move into this leadership position? Maybe uh, Omar, if you want to start. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, Anna, just, just, just think of the physical aspect <laughs> of, of, of the change. As a designer uh, or designer, design director, creative director, let's say you know you're you're dedicated to the craft. Your the main part of your day will be in front of your computer, designing in front of someone else's computer, supervising, guiding, you know, directing, uh, helping them make decisions. Uh, you might be meeting clients, uh, so you will be in the meeting room, okay, but you won't probably be where there will, where the strategy will be made with the client, where the strategy made with, with you know, the, the directing committee of your, your agency. So you move from the second half of that, you know, of the of the double diamond, the second half of the uh, of the of the design thinking uh, process, which is more the framing part. Okay. 
tend to do more and more, even as you're, you're calling the shots, you're helping the CEO of the company, the, the CIO and the CMO, you're, you're helping them understand really what needs to be taken care of. Again, strategy, what's, what's important, what's not important. What are the big problems, not the small, what are the big design problems, not the small design problems, you know? There's a fantastic, you know, Tim Brown video on this, uh, uh, moving from design to design thinking, you know, when, and he speaks about when, you know, today, you know, there, you know, design was big when Brunel designed how to get from London to, you know, the United States, designing the whole, uh, in, in the whole transport system from road to, to sea and so on and so on, to when design became small and it all boiled down to making chairs and you know and uh, and and in clothing and cars. So yeah, today moving from design moving to design leader position is is that uh, seeing uh, taking care of the big picture. Of design and not the small one, the, the execution, only the execution part. I, I think that's the hugest difference of all. Then, of course, on a practical level, as I said before, it's moving from me to we, from ego to empathy, because your job is really day by day, make getting the people around you to do their best. Uh, and, and yeah, yeah I, I think these are the two spheres, the two levels, the two dimensions that are most important. Awesome, thank you for sharing, Omar. Xavi, would you right. like to also share a little bit for? Yeah, I'd love to. Um, I've thought a lot about this question in general and uh, I'd like to latch on to what Lawrence was saying earlier uh, because that's the one thing that keeps coming front of mind when I think about the challenges I'm facing and recent design leaders face. It's a kind of a bifaceted challenge, actually, because as a design leader, you have the power to influence the strategic high stakes decisions, but often you find yourself in, in situations where you're not a part of that table. And, uh, and neither in traditional design education, you're taught how to speak to the C-suite, right? Like you, it's not an MBA, you don't have the language, you don't have the jargon, you don't have the, you know, the acronyms that they're using. And, and so you struggle with the, the other face of this challenge is this uh, sort of an imposter syndrome. So you keep like, you keep feeling it's not enough, even if you have uh, value to add in your own voice on those tables. Um, you, you struggle with your own inner voice and at the same time, the lack of that, the, the boardroom's not being ready for, for those voices yet, at least not at the mainstream level. So that's something that I continue to face, but um, something that I've, I've found for myself working is by upskilling myself, constantly educating myself and also working uh, on, it, within like on the inner inner uh, doing the inner work that's needed to be a leader right like I have an innovation uh, I have a coach who is who is helping me sort of find my own voice and uh, and I really recommend uh, all design leaders and aspiring leaders to invest in in finding your own voice and in whichever form that may be whether it's through you know personal development workshops retreats books mentors coaches I, yeah, that's how I'm sort of navigating this challenge. Awesome. That's really good, right? And uh, I was already seeing the time and uh, we are almost at one hour already. It's so nice to talk to you. It's, it's fast, so fast, right? Uh, and I actually, uh, moving on exactly from this top, Chavi, you mentioned a little bit, right, uh, on things that you can do uh, to improve yourself, to grow yourself as a leader, or to maybe even become a leader if you're not yet, or to prepare uh, to become a leader, what would be your suggestions, your um, tips for uh, everyone who is here today that is starting to become a leader or wants to move into a leadership position? Maybe Chavi, if you want to continue since you were already on that note. Yeah, so the two things are upskilling and investing in your inner work and getting to know yourself, finding alignment with, the, with your purpose and who you are and what you do. And uh, in terms of upskilling, I'm focusing a lot on 
on politics, economy, finance, because I feel like when you're solving the macro problems of the world, the complex, wicked problems, you almost always are faced with with a with a financial um, you know nuance to it, or an economic nuance, or a political nuance. Anywhere where there is real power uh, in the world, so I'm. I'm investing on understanding how the power dynamics in the world works. And it's something I feel that layers really well with the creative education. It complements it in a, in a good way. Awesome, very interesting indeed, right? Especially in this remote work where we have teams with people from all over the world, we have to understand how things work everywhere, right? So really, really interesting, Chavi. Thank you for the tip. Maybe Omar, would you like to share some thoughts on that? Could you mind repeating the question, please, so I can, of <laughs> can frame it properly? <laughs> of course. What would you? What would be the suggestions or tips that you would give to uh, everyone that is in here uh, today, or that will maybe watch the recording later, if they want to become a design leader, or if they are beginning uh, their journey as a leader? What would be your your suggestions for them? Well, I think I think. I think Chavi just, you know, gave us the key, which is, uh, you know, we have to we have to keep in mind that what we know as non-design leaders, okay, is not going to be enough to be a design leader. So we we certainly need to acquire the right skills, and uh, that means uh, find the time, you know, to dedicate to learning, to you know, to putting in practice what you learn. Um, and that's fortunately that's easy. I mean, you don't have to not necessarily you have to go back to you know uh, university life. Uh, online today we have an enormous uh, abundance of, of great courses that, that can be taken uh, you know uh, online and um, that's very important. And for, I think that there's also an area of science today that's particularly uh, interesting, which is uh, behavioral economics. Uh, some of you have probably uh, read the book Nudge. Uh, there's a, a recent uh, re-editing of that. Um, and, you know, in dealing with and having to mostly deal with people that I think that's a really important start. Then, yeah, you have to also be able to take care of the business needs of your clients because if you can't do that, you're not going to have a group of people to guide to, <laughs> to work properly with. First of all, you're going to have to, you have to be able to be a leader for your clients. Otherwise, you know, there, there's, there's nothing else behind before that. So learning how to solve and to listen, to, to listen and to solve business problems, I think is incredibly important if you want to be at that strategy table in that C-suite uh, context from the, from the very beginning of, of each uh, challenge. That is very true, right? You touched on one really important part. That is something that I'm constantly repeating, especially to user experience designers, right? Where it's all about the user. And I always say, yes, it is all about the user, but you have to also understand the business and connect the business, right? Otherwise there will not be any users for you to develop the product for, right? <laughs> Lawrence, what are your thoughts? Um, uh, mine are kind of fairly straightforward, I think. Um, I would start with having a view, having an opinion, having something to say. And then I would say, leading on from that, express your view, express your opinion, um, because People will follow those that have views, that have opinions, that have a direction. Um, my next would be to say, never stop learning. And of course, I would say that because I'm in education. But, you know, when you get to the kind of uh, landmarks that Omar and I have got to, you're only continuing to evolve. I mean, look at the bookshelf behind Omar, you know. We're only, we have to keep learning. It's just, you know, I don't need to say any more than that. And then I guess, so what's that? Have a, have a view, have an opinion. Number two, express it. Number three, never stop learning. 
And number four, kind of more importantly, probably more important than any of those is, is, is be you, be yourself, because you get found out if you are trying some kind of persona. You know, people that get involved in design are, are people that are empathetic, that they want to make the world a better place, whether that's on a micro or a macro scale, and have confidence in being the person that you, that you are. And through kind of non-stop lifelong learning, you will, you know, the being you will become easier. You'll become a better version of you um, by expressing opinions, by learning and being around people. Lawrence? Lawrence? Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, a, few, a few days ago, we, we had a, we exchanged a few lines on the issue of stretching. And I think you have, you had a great opinion on the issue of stretching. You, <laughs> you, want, you want to what share that one? <laughs> I'm trying to remember what I said. Did, did I say something like, um, did I say something like, what's the worst that can happen? They can't call the police on you. Um, you know, you're, yeah, you said that. But you also said how, you know, we we're, were talking about how, you know, we were talking about how important it is to understand if in our daily work, where we stretch a lot as design leaders, we have to, because we're dealing with, you know, very complex problems, very broad ones, uh, you know, very often, you know, very entangled ones and multidisciplinary ones, multi So it's a lot about stretching uh, our knowledge, our skills, our capabilities. And the question very often, either you're a very confident person or you're a person like me, Always asking, am I stretching too much or too little? What, what was your response on that? You said, <laughs> I, I was looking that back because Omar and I were, were in a WhatsApp conversation uh, last week or so, and we were talking about stretch. And uh, and I, I kind of admitted that I built a career on stretching, that, that um, unless you're prepared to, to some extent to venture into the unknown and take some risks and be prepared to kind of fail, you know, they, they're kind of cliches really, but they, they still run very true that, that you know, totally. the work that we do is, is, is important work, but that kind of never stop learning and being prepared to stretch and put yourself into positions and places that will be challenging. You know, think back to the first commercial project you worked on after you graduated and how nerve wracking that was. And then six months later, that just felt like, well, what was I so worried about? And being prepared to scare yourself, you know, at points in your career, I think is critical to one's development because we learn from being in that place where we're kind of terrified and, and we adapt and we get things wrong, but we learn from getting things wrong and we learn from getting things right. And that kind of high five moment where you've made yourself very scared. I took, I, I'm very fortunate. I have a very young daughter um, and she went for her first swimming lesson on Saturday. And for two days, she was saying, I don't want to go. I don't want to go. I don't want to go to swimming lesson. Don't make me go. It'll be horrible. Within moments of that swimming lesson finished, she's five years old. Um, she said to me, when do I get my next swimming lesson? And I said, well, it's next week. I've got to wake a whole week for another swimming lesson. And we all remember that feeling. We all remember that feeling that once you've kind of stretched yourself, it's worked. You want to do it again and you want to swim for longer or swim deeper dive further and uh, you know I, yeah good point omar thanks for the reminder stretch is stretch is good, good. stretch is good all right thank you so much i think we've all had some amazing tips and suggestions and lots of food for thought i actually took a lot of notes myself from all of the things that you've shared with us. So thank you again, uh, Xavi, Lawrence, and Omar. Uh, we are already at the end of our hour. It passed so fast. Like I said, it was a pleasure talking to you tonight. Uh, it's a really good way to start the week, right? So thank you again. And uh, thank you, Luna, as well, 
for uh, receiving us, for ECHOS, for uh, uh, opening up um, the opportunity for me to, to host these sessions. It's been a pleasure. And like I said, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, all of you, for joining. And I hope you enjoyed it. It was great. Thank you all. Thank, thanks, everyone. Thank you, Carol. I would so, like, okay. before we go, I would like to just share with you guys, all of you that are here, a special coupon code for those who want to participate in the course. It starts in less than two weeks. So you literally have one week, maybe, maybe 10 days to, to join us. Um, it starts on May 9th. So this is, this is a thank you for participating because if it wasn't for people in the chat asking questions and signing up, um, the, the session wouldn't be the same. Another thing so too is that we have the ebook, a free ebook from season one. Um, you will find the QR code here soon. And in a couple of days before the launching of the program, we are launching the second ebook also for free with insights from all the global masterclasses. So make sure to download the first one so you'll be updated with the second one when we launch it. And I know it will be, that would be a lot of food for thought, just like the session with you guys. Thank you so much for being here today. I hope that we can have other conversations like that. Uh, Carol, thank you so much for facilitating this fire sessions. It has been a pleasure to have you as an ambassador. Chavi was an amazing ambassador last year as well. We had amazing conversations and these conversations will be ongoing for season three and four. And yeah, that's it for now. Thank you so much for, for being here. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Pleasure. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Ciao, Omar. Ciao, Kleber. <laughs> Klebinho, eu não sabia era que era você. Obrigada por estar aqui. Thank you for being here. <laughs> nice. Have That's a good dinner, Kleber. We're, we're, we're in the same time zone. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's yeah. holiday here in Italy, right? Yeah, oh, it's yeah, always it's holiday in Italy. Italy. Let's be, let's be <laughs> no, fair. No, it's not really. <laughs> ciao, ciao. Bye-bye, ciao, ciao. Bye-bye, bye-bye, guys. Thank you, bye.